Scripture reading today is from Romans chapter 1 and 3. It comes from the New Living Testament. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as we promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Veni Sancti Spiritus Veni Sancti Spiritus Veni Sancti Spiritus Oh, this Latin Vulgate Bible is so heavy. It builds the soul, it builds the shoulder. Well, we Germans, we love our beer, but the trouble with beer is it comes with beer bellies. Buy ten, get one free. What I love about being a monk is you get to wear these big robes that cover everything. October 3rd, 1521. My dear and honorable Staupitz, the visitors you have been sending are a great refreshment to my soul. Keep sending them. Yours humbly, Martin Luther. Hmm. Oh, you must be the visitors. I've been expecting you from the West. Thank you for coming and welcome to Wartburg Castle. This is my gilded cage. I'm not allowed to leave because men are on the hunt for me, and if they find me, they will kill me. So I'm glad you have come to show your support. Things have never been the same since four years ago when I put those 95 theses on the wall of Castle Church in Wittenberg. My life has never been the same. You see, they were in response to indulgences, this awful practice in the church called indulgences. What are indulgences? Indulgences are the selling of the forgiveness of sins for money. You sin, you buy this certificate of indulgence, and voila, your sins are washed away. Horrible. It is absolutely not of the Bible. It's not in there. In fact, it's worse than neutral because it's leading people astray. You see, the church has long taught that the way to absolve your sins is you confess to a confessor priest and he gives you penance to do at home. Maybe it's to pray the rosary or say some Hail Marys or some kind of church service. Well, then someone came along and said, well, why have them perform these things? Why not just have them give money instead? And then the next step was, is, well, why not absolve also the sins of their relatives who have gone before them, who have died and are in purgatory. And then they really wrench the emotions by saying, well, your loved ones right now, they are languishing in pain and purgatory, and all it takes are a few silver coins to free them. There was this saying that when the coin in the coffer rings, 
the soul from purgatory springs. Why does it seem nowadays that everything about the church is money, money, money? The love of money is corruption. And we turn our back on the love of God. How did the Archbishop of all of Germany get his position? He sent mule loads of silver down to Rome as the highest bidder. And this great church that's being built right now in Rome, St. Peter's, is going to be fabulous in the center of the Christian world, but it's sweeping up money from all over Europe and sending it down to Rome. And even heaven is for sale to pay for it all. Oh, some of the recent popes have been real doozies. It was a hundred years ago that there were actually three popes vying for the papacy, all at once saying that they were the legitimate pope. And even 20 years ago when I was school age, Pope Alexander, he fathered seven children while he was cardinal before he became pope. I really never realized that celibate birdies could be so fertile. And today's pope, Leo, he became archbishop at age eight. On his merits, <laughs> he became cardinal at 13 and pope at 37, undoubtedly the highest bidder from his family money, the Medici family. It's no wonder that indulgences became so popular and widespread and effective. Well, through all of these years, I was having my own struggles with understanding salvation. Well, let me take you back a couple of decades. I never intended to become a monk or even to work in the church. I had just gotten my master's degree, and I was about to start law school, per my father's wishes. I was going to join the family mining business. And so I was going home to make a visit to my parents, when all of a sudden there was a rainstorm they came up and thunder clouds and thunder was booming all around me and I was trying to find cover and then all of a sudden boom lightning struck right by me I was terrified I cried out to Saint Anne mother of Mary save me I will become a monk Well, true to my word, within two weeks, I dropped out of law school and I went across town to an Augustinian monastery and became a monk. Well, I was true to going to confession in that monastery, and I was confessing all the time. I didn't want to leave one sin unconfessed, because what if I died with an unconfessed sin? Would God still receive me? It troubled me to no end. My confessor priest was sick and tired of me confessing all the time. He said, Martin, why don't you go out and actually commit a real sin? Go kill somebody and then come back and you have something finally to confess. But then a light came on. Romans 1.17 was like a beacon. The righteous shall live by faith. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to pay for it. We can't. We can't earn it. Salvation comes by grace through faith in Christ for the glory of God. That's what the scriptures say. What a relief. Well, by that time, I had become a professor. I had gotten my doctorate. I was a professor at the University of Wittenberg. And more and more, these traveling indulgence preachers were coming around, selling their forgiveness of sins and leading the people astray, and I had to act. So I began writing these theses. I thought 20 would be enough. But kind of like when you go to the Munich market, during Oktoberfest, you think you're going to buy 20 things and you come out with 95. Number 27, 
Indulgence preachers are only preaching human doctrines to get money to clink into the church coffers. Number 32, those confident of their indulgence certificates will be eternally damned with their teachers. Number 77, to say the cross emblazoned with the papal coat of arms as set up by the indulgence preachers is equal in worth to the cross of Christ is blasphemy. And so I nailed these 95 theses up on those big wooden doors. It's what any scholar would do to invite other scholars to a debate on what has been posted. It's very common. Well, at the same time, I sent a letter to the Archbishop of Germany. Maybe my humble words would prompt him to end this terrible practice of indulgences. Well, at the same time, and without my knowing it at the time, there was this new invention called the printing press. And it sent my 95 theses all over Germany. Well, the Germans didn't mind because so much German money had sprouted wings and had taken flight south over the Alps to Rome. And those 95 theses went all across Europe, including into the parlors of kings and emperors, archbishops, and even to the Vatican. They wanted to have an inquisition for me in Rome, but we knew that that would be fatal. They would capture me before my inquisition and they would burn me at the stake like so many others who dared to challenge the church. So my protector, the great Duke Frederick the Wise, he negotiated with none other than the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire himself to have my inquisition on German soil. And so I was brought before a bunch of highfalutin people, this assembly called a diet in the city, the German city of Worms. You English speakers like to joke that I had a diet of worms. But there I was, in this great, beautiful hall at my own inquisition. The Pope's chief prosecutor was elevated as if on a throne, wearing his finery and all of the wonderful gold and jewels on his fingers, looking disdainfully and impatiently down at me, a simple monk wearing simple monk's clothes. He began kindly enough. My son, just recant these 95 theses. All will be made well, and you can go back to your quiet life in Wittenberg. I humbly answered, Your Honor, I will be glad to recant if someone can show me the error of my ways in the Bible. Nobody back then, even in the church, read the Bible and much less studied it. But as time went on, he grew more and more impatient. And he said, Mr. Luther, you are a heretic. Recant. Nobody challenges the Pope and gets away with it. You must recant. And unbowed and determined, I said, here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. At that, the prosecutor's book slammed shut, and he said, you will shortly get a judgment. And that judgment was a papal directive giving me 60 days to recant, or I would face excommunication from the church. I burned that directive. We all knew that my life was in danger, and so I was spirited out of Worms to this great Wartburg castle in which I am in hiding. Well, things are not so bad. Actually, I've been waiting for years to finally get a sabbatical to work on a special project of mine, translating the New Testament into German from the original Greek so that all Germans 
may read the Word of God and see what it says. For it says that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. No more will there be a monopoly on Scripture or ignoring it as if it didn't matter. It does matter. Scripture is a light. Scripture is a fountain of life. And let's drink of it deeply. And may God himself bless us and help us as we learn his word and seek to obey it. Well, again, I want to say thank you for sneaking in here and visiting me and providing this very important fellowship and encouragement. I think there's no better thing that we can do together than to celebrate the Lord's table together. One of the most sacred acts that we can do in church. So with that, why don't we celebrate the Lord's table?